The Tafsir of Surah Tawaha by Shaykh Abdul Nasser Jangda. The following video is from the Quran Intensive, Bayina Summer Program. For more information, go to bayinasummer.com. This video was filmed and produced by Salam Studios and is brought to you by MuslimMatters.org. Inshallah, we're going to be starting from ayah number 77. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد أوحينا إلى موسى أن أسر بعبادي فاضرب لهم طريقا فاضرب لهم طريقا في البحر يبسا لا تخاف دركا ولا تخشى فأتبعهم فرعون بجنوده فغشيهم من اليم ما غشيهم وأضل فرعون قومه وما هدى يا بني إسرائيل قد أنجيناكم قد أنجيناكم من عدوكم ووعدناكم جانب الطور الأيمن ونزلنا عليكم المن والسلوى كلوا من طيبات ما رزقناكم ولا تطغوا فيه فيحل عليكم غضبي ومن يحلل عليه غضبي فقد هوى وَإِنِّي لَغَفَّارٌ لِمَا تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا ثُمَّ اهْتَدَى <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين just, just a second while he changes the batteries So, alhamdulillah, previously we, previously we talked about the story of the magicians who accepted Islam and exactly what transpired with them. And at the end of that passage, in the last three ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us with the proper perspective going forward and some of the lessons that we can take home, that we can learn from this particular incident and this story and this situation. In ayah number 77, it is a transition in the story of Musa alayhi salam. It is transitioning over to much, much later in the story of Musa alayhi salam and, exact, and all of his experiences. To kind of fill in a little bit of the context. So Musa alayhi salam came to Fir'aun, presented the message, presented the miracles. Fir'aun, of course, he rejected and he denied and he refused. At which point in time, that showdown occurred between Musa alayhi salam and the magicians and Harun alayhi salam of course was there as well. And the magicians, you know, they, they, they were defeated in this showdown and not only that, but that led to them overall realizing and understanding and accepting iman into their hearts and submitting before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being counted amongst the believers. And as we talked about, the general context of the story tells us that Fir'aun carried through with his threat to the magicians and uh, martyred and killed and murdered all of them. What happened thereafter was Musa alayhi salam of course continued to you know, talk to Fir'aun, preach the message to Fir'aun and continued to try to reason with Fir'aun. On the other side, Musa alayhi salam continued to teach and propagate the message and create a proper perspective for the people of Banu Israel who by no means before this um, there's nothing telling us before this that they didn't believe or they didn't have iman. But nevertheless, that doesn't change the fact that they, just like anyone else, they required more tarbiyah, more ta'aleem. They required more education in terms of their faith and their iman and they needed growing spiritually. And so Musa alayhi salam is continuing to focus on the spiritual well-being of the people of Banu Israel. 
and at the same time continuing to plead with Fir'aun. Musa alayhi salam's message to Fir'aun, as, as mentioned in the Quran numerous places, when he first came to Fir'aun was twofold. Number one, it was for Fir'aun himself to realize and understand. And also the reason why Allah states two things is, number one, either hopefully he himself will realize the message, or at the very least he will be fearful of the consequences of the continued oppression of these innocent people, these people that he has enslaved and that he oppresses so terribly. So the message to Fir'aun was twofold. Believe and let Banu Israel go. Free them. Stop oppressing them. Release them from the servitude. And Musa alayhi salam continued to present these two messages and continued to plead with Fir'aun on these two fronts. What transpired and what happened is that there's a very lengthy hadith in the kitab of tafsir from the collection of Imam Nasai Sunan that mentions a very lengthy hadith that is referred to by the muhaddithun as hadithul futun hadithul futun the hadith of different tech different tests and trials and Many classical scholars have validated the authenticity of this narration. But what it tells us is that Fir'aun, in his insolence, in his stubbornness, he continued to grow more and more aggressive and continued to accelerate and intensify his oppression of Banu Israel. He just got worse and worse and worse from here on out. Almost to spite Musa alayhi salam. Despite Musa alayhi salam, to retaliate to Musa alayhi salam, because he was infuriated by how dare this boy think he can come and preach to me and tell me what to do. That he's like, oh really, you want me to let them go? You want me to stop doing this to them? How about this? And he would just continue to intensify the oppression and the violence against Banu Israel. When that happened, when that transpired, Allah does not wrong anyone in the least bit. So a, a very appropriate fitting response came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As, Musa, as, as Fir'aun continued to intensify his oppression, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intensified the message to Fir'aun. And this is alluded to in Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 133. عَلَيْهِمْ Allah says that we send upon them, Fir'aun and his people, atufan, torrent storms, like terrible, terrible storms and weather and winds and tornadoes and hurricanes, however you want to understand this. فَرَسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمُ الطُّوفَانِ وَالْجَرَادِ And we sent upon them locusts وَالْقُمَّلِ An infestation of lice وَالْضَفَادِعِ Frogs A complete infestation of frogs وَالْدَمْ And literally everything that they touched, all the water that they had access to was turning into blood آيَاتٍ مُفَصَّلَاتٍ these were very clear open signs. And the other thing that the word mufassalat signifies is that they were separated. Meaning, and the hadith fills in the context. What does that mean? That these signs were clear, but they were also separated. The tufan would come upon Fir'aun and his people. And they would suffer because of it. Fir'aun would call Musa alayhi salam and would beg and plead with him. Please pray that your Lord, your master, he removes this punishment from us, and I promise, I'll send Banu Israel with you. I'll let them go. And so Musa salam would go and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate this punishment, and the punishment would stop, would cease, and Musa salam would come, say, all right, I'm ready to take Banu Israel, and Fir'aun would say, I don't know what you're talking about. When did I say that? Did you hear me say that? Did anybody hear me say that? I don't, th I, I don't think so. I don't think so. And he would completely go back on his word. And then the jarad would come. The, the locusts. Same thing, Fir'aun would come to Musa Alisan very contrite. And would say, please pray to your Lord to remove this. To grant us reprieve. And I promise I'll let them go. I'll release them. Again, Musa alayhi would make dua, the punishment would be lifted, Fir'aun would say, I don't know what you're talking about. And one after another after another, he kept doing this. There's something very interesting, very distinct, about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Fir'aun in the book of Allah, in the Qur'an. That it's very clear, Fir'aun was a terrible person. 
And Fir'aun suffered a terrible fate. But there's also this fact is clearly established if you just look, study, and compare. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about these different notorious, nefarious people throughout the Qur'an who were punished by Allah, who were held accountable by Allah, that Allah gave no one more chances than He gave to Fir'aun. No one was given more opportunity, more chances to change, to turn things around than Fir'aun was. And that shows you the love, the kindness, the generosity, the compassion of Allah. Now, when all of that transpired, and some of the historians, some of the muhaddithun, some of the scholars, they actually say that this lasted for years. This entire ordeal, this entire ordeal of all these different signs coming and punishments coming, and this back and forth and back and forth and negotiating with Fir'aun, this lasted for years. So you have to understand what that must have been like, how difficult that must have been. Now, let's draw the parallel to the life of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, we talk a lot about, in, in, in my seerah classes as well, I always emphasize this. And, and of course, every aspect, every part of the life of the Prophet ﷺ needs to be emphasized and studied. But oftentimes for us, oftentimes for us as a community, there's such a heavy emphasis on the Medinan era, the 10 years in al Madinatul Munawwara, rightfully so, but it's at the expense of focusing on the Meccan era. And the Meccan era was 13 years. In the Medinan era, there were battles and there were wars and there was difficulty and there was starvation and there was suffering. There was all these different issues. No doubt, it was a huge and a great sacrifice. And that's why the people who were there at the Bay'ah تحت الشجرة that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Surah Al-Fatih. That's why they had a higher status and a higher reward than the people that came afterwards. But also what cannot be discounted is that at least in the Medinan era, they were at some level standing on their own feet and they were at least making an effort to fight back. They had that much permission, they had that much strength and that much fortitude. In the Meccan era, it was not even that. It was just all out open oppression without even the ability to be able to retaliate or defend oneself. Imagine what 13 years of that was like. And so the Prophet of Allah وسلم, when the surah is being revealed, is in the middle of that Makkan era. And it's starting to become very difficult, very hard to bear. This is part of what contributed to many of the Sahaba migrating to Abyssinia because they were no longer able to deal with the continued pressure and persecution. And so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again sending that message, drawing that parallel to the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that look, similarly, just like Quraysh, it's this constant back and forth, and this is ongoing struggle, Musa ﷺ dealt with the same thing, creating that sense of fraternity, that connection, and the believers receiving this message, and we similarly need to understand. Imagine this, when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, at the heat of oppression in Mecca, at the height of the oppression and persecution in Mecca, when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and when they basically plead, not complain, but they plead, they cry. Mata Nasrullah, when will the help of Allah arrive? And the Prophet sallallahu said, Ala innakum qawmun tasta'jilun. You people are rushing things. There were people before you, yumshatu bi amshat al hadid. They would be skinned alive with iron combs. That an axe or a, a, a huge sword, an axe would be placed in the middle of their head and they would literally be chopped into half. And they would be killed and tortured in this manner. If the Messenger of Allah is telling the Sahaba, that you guys are being too hasty in this regard. You need to stand firm, you need to be strong, you need to keep going. We need to understand that yes, again, we're dealing with circumstances, we're dealing with situations, but a little bit of perspective is always healthy. That when we look at the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, when we look at the suffering of these people at the hands of Fir'aun and his mala, his elite class, his elite circle, we understand, we gain a little bit of perspective that how we need to fall back on patience. And we need to continue to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so this ordeal lasted for a few years. And then finally in ayah number 77, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Musa alayhi salam, when it was at the point where it's fine, that's done, Fir'aun is not realizing, he's not understanding, he's not budging, Allah said that we commanded Musa alayhi salam, وَلَقَدَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى Musa. Ayah number 77, that we inspired, we commanded, we revealed to Musa alayhi salam. And asri bi ibadi. What did we instruct him to do through divine revelation, divine inspiration? And asri bi ibadi. Al isra in the Arabic language literally means to travel by night, to move at night time. A lot of times there's the curiosity that if it means already to travel by night, then why in Surah Al Isra, Surah number 17, does Allah say, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan? Why does Allah say night? Is it redundant? No, because you have to read ahead. Min al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa. From Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa. That the Prophet ﷺ undertook this journey in, in, at night, by night, but because it was such a huge distance. That at that point in time, with the modes of transportation that were the means of transportation that were available to them, that is, it, it is unfathomable, it cannot be understood, it could not be comprehended by these people, that all of this would transpire and happen in one night. So Allah for further emphasis says, Laylan, which means one night, that our slave, subhanallah, asra bi abdihi, Allah says that he took his slave by night, in one single night, in one night to Masjid Haram, back to Masjid Aqsa, and back to, and then of course the journey, the ascension above the heavens, and then brought him back to Masjid Haram. So that's why that Laylan is repeated there. But nevertheless, here, an Asri, Isra, by in and of itself, the word it means to travel by night. So Allah says, We commanded Musa alayhi salam, an Asri bi ibadi, that take and move, travel by night with our slaves, with my slaves, Allah says. And what's very interesting here, this is a form of iltifat. This is a form of iltifat. Allah starts the ayah by saying, وَلَقَدَ أَوْحَيْنَا Which is plural. We commanded. And that's the royal majestic we, the plural. Because when the superior is giving the command to the lower, when the superior is giving the command to the subordinate, of course this is Rabbul الْعَالَمِينَ giving a command to a messenger of his, so he's superior. So when he's commanding him, he says it in a plural because he's speaking from a position of superiority. But when Allah commands Musa alayhi salam to actually move with Banu Israel and the people, he says, An asri bi ibadi, my slaves. It switched from the plural to the singular. The question is why? Because speaking in the singular is a much more personal address, it's more intimate, it's more personal. It's like if I am speaking on behalf of the community and I'm saying we made this arrangement, we did this and we did that and we wanted to provide this and we wanted to accommodate that. But then after talking on behalf of the community or in an organization or a group of people and I'm speaking in the plural, then if I'd like to interject a little bit of a personal thing and say, and I personally, I personally made sure that this was taken care of. Just like that type of a transition would be done why? To show more personal attention and care. That yes, we as a group or an organization or as an institution made these arrangements, but I personally oversaw this aspect of it. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that we commanded, we divinely inspired to Musa to move at night with our slaves. But then Allah didn't say with our slaves, He says, I commanded Musa, we commanded Musa alayhi salam to move at night with my slaves. They are my slaves. And this is a loving, affectionate address. That you've suffered a lot. You've gone through a lot. And now I've made arrangements for you. Arrangements that you could never have expected. You never could have expected. Now the other thing is, typically it's talking to Banu Israel. Banu Israel, and we'll see that even in ayah number 80, Allah will speak to Banu Israel. He will address them. And yes, that when you're speaking to a big group of people, you can speak to them according to the majority. But one of the wisdoms and the reasons why the scholars say Allah specifically here didn't say an asri bi bani Israela, why Allah said bi ibadi, is because to acknowledge, again, this is a loving, affectionate address, right? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
consoling them. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala personally guaranteeing to them that they were going to be okay. So there were other believers amongst their ranks. Some of the Qibtiyun, some of the people of Fir'aun had accepted Iman, had accepted Islam, and joined the ranks of Musa alayhi salam. The Quran explicitly tells us about at least one of this, one of these people. وَقَالَ رَجُلٌ مُؤْمِنٌ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنِ يَكْتُمُ إِيمَانَهُ That there was a man who was a believer who was hiding his faith and he belonged to the people of Fir'aun. So there were the occasional, the few scattered people who had believed from the people of Fir'aun. That Allah is even acknowledging them by saying, my slaves. So Allah commanded Musa alayhi salam, you take my slaves by night and you leave. Just go at night, undetected, unnoticed, just leave. Now they set out at night, and you can imagine, tra traveling at night, even now, a lot of times people, it's not a very desirable thing to travel at night. It's not a very desirable time to travel at night. I mean the red eye flight. Nobody likes taking the red-eye flight, all right? But at the same time, even driving, even though we have lights and headlights and cars and highways are lit and things like that, still people prefer not to travel at night. Imagine at a time when these types of arrangements aren't there. Traveling at night is very stressful, very dangerous, very difficult. So now they're leaving, they're going. And it was very taxing, it was very difficult, it was a huge test. But they depart, they leave. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam, فَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ طَرِيقًا فِي الْبَحْرِ فَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ طَرِيقًا فِي الْبَحْرِ And strike for them a path in the ocean. And of course the books of history, and even that hadith that I alluded to earlier, makes it very clear that the ocean that is being alluded to is the Red Sea. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam that strike for them a path in the ocean. Now even this فَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ طَرِيقًا ضَرْبُ tariq is actually an expression in classical Arabic. It's kinayat and it's majazan. It's an expression in the Arabic language which basically means to carve out a path. To make a way. So make a way for them in the ocean. But even the, the re, one of the, and see this is the Quranic eloquence. One of the wisdoms, one of the profound realizations and nuances of why Allah used this particular expression to talk about making a path for them through the ocean was specifically, was specifically referenced, was alluded to. Why? Because how was that path made in the ocean? Can you imagine just receiving the instruction, make a path for tens of thousands of people through the ocean? It's like, how, how are we going to do that? But it's a very subtle, it's a very subtle reference to, it's going to happen through miraculous means. And what was eventually that miraculous means? As Allah mentions in Surah number 26, Surah Al-Shu'ara, that فَضْرِبْ بِعَصَاكَ الْبَحْرَ فَانْفَلَقْ that strike the ocean with your staff. Strike the ocean with your staff. فَانْفَلَقْ And it will split open. And Allah says actually in the past, it splits open. فَكَانَ كُلُّ فِرْقٍ كَالطَّوْدِ الْعَظِيمِ That each and every single group, or every, each and every single one of the paths, was like a standing mountain, a huge mountain, that the water literally stood up that the water moved back and it stood up and it looked like a huge wall, a huge mountain. It was rising so high. The Quran describes it in this graphic form. لا يخاف دركا لا تخاف دركا ولا تخشى. Allah says here, فضرب لهم طريقا في البحر يبسا. That strike for them, make a way for them in the ocean, a path for them in the ocean. يبسا that will be dry. And this Yabasan is to further express how miraculous this event is going to be. That the ocean, the ground of the ocean will be dry. And you have to understand one thing. As believers, we have to realize one thing. When Allah says, Yabis, Yabasan, al yubsu which means for something to be dry, it, doesn't, it literally means that it was dried up. That when the water receded and made a path, it wasn't just that the water, most of it moved and they kind of waded through the water. No, no, Allah says that it was dry, the path. 
And when Allah says that the path was dry, doesn't it just mean that most of the water moved and the ground was still muddy? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even removed the water part particles that had mixed up with the dirt on the ground of the ocean, and so much so that that ground that they were walking on was like dry dirt. It was dry dirt that they were walking on. This is what an unbelievable miracle it was. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this. Yabasan, it's dry. Now, couldn't Banu Israel have walked through a little bit of mud? Sure. But of course, this not only shows us the miracle of Allah, but this again shows that love, that affection, that care, that consideration from Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to completely remove any fear or apprehension from their hearts, that when they look down, this is the bottom, this is the floor of the ocean, the sea, and it is dry. Just imagine what they, how, in, how, how confident, how well taken care of they must have felt at that moment. And then Allah tells Musa alayhi salam, لَا تَخَافُ دَرَكًا Don't fear being followed. Don't fear being followed. That someone will catch up to you, someone will grab you from behind. Darak, you won't be caught. So don't fear being caught. وَلَا تَخْشَى And don't be overwhelmed, don't be afraid. Now, what's interesting here is when Allah says, لَا تَخْشَى he does not mention don't be afraid and don't be overwhelmed by what? The object, the maf'ul is not mentioned here. Why is it not mentioned here? So the scholars discuss this ayah based on other ayats of the Qur'an. They say that it's fair to understand and realize that Allah means here, لا تخشى غرقا Do not be fearful of drowning. Do not be fearful of drowning. But at the same time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala omitted the, the, the maf'ul, he omitted the object and left it open-ended. He did it for a reason and a purpose. The first purpose that we can, we can extract from that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, based on the other ayat of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't be fearful of drowning. But Allah didn't say drowning, He left it open-ended. Why? Because why should you not be fearful of drowning is something that you could never ever imagine. Like, you're, go you're going to eventually end up facing the ocean and the army behind you. Why would you not be afraid of drowning? Because, and, and you should not be afraid of drowning because the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save you from drowning is something that you possibly cannot comprehend. If this was told to you, if it was explained to you, all right, look, we're going to go, we're going to be at the... Uh, the edge of the ocean, I'm going to hit the ocean with my staff, and then all the water is going to move back and stand up, and then the floor is going to be dry, and we're going to walk through. Be like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> right? I mean, as human beings, there's no reason to ever doubt a messenger of Allah. There's no reason to doubt the kalam of Allah. But human beings, weakness. It's the test and the trial of the human being. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just said, La taqshar. just don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I'm not even going to bother to tell you. Because these people will not understand, even if I was to explain. They would never be able to comprehend. Because it's out of just, we have no frame of reference for something like that. We have no frame of reference for something like that. That's how great the power of Allah is. And the last and the final thing we can extract from this is nevertheless, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves it open, leaves it general, al to bi umumil lafz. We have to at the same time appreciate it completely open-ended, that when Allah is saying, don't be fearful, don't be overwhelmed. He means don't be overwhelmed of anything. Don't be overwhelmed by the ocean. Don't be overwhelmed by the army chasing you from behind that they might catch up to you because Allah has said they will not catch up to you. Don't be afraid. Don't be apprehensive of anything here at all. You're taken care of. In no way, shape, or form should you be afraid of anything. Should you be worried about anything? Just remember Allah, do the dhikr of Allah and keep pushing forward. Allah's got all the arrangements taken care of. Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also being told the same exact thing. All the arrangements are made. All the arrangements are made. At Sulah Hudaybiyah, at the battle of Khandaq, when the Prophet sallallahu strikes the rock and says, I see that Rome has been conquered, Persia has been conquered. Can you imagine what people must have thought when they heard that? And their narrations, we talk about the munafiqun got together right away, they just looked for an opportunity. He's lost it. He's officially lost it. At Sulah Hudaybiyah, they're returning back after a moral defeat. 
or at least what the eyes would tell you was a moral defeat. And Allah is saying, فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا Open victory has been granted to you. Where's the victory? But he's being told, arrangements are made. You just keep going forward doing what you got to do. And so similarly, don't worry about anything. Now, فَأَتْبَعَهُمْ فِرْعَوْنُ بِجُنُودِهِ now Banu Israel and Musa alayhi salam, Harun alayhi salam at the head and Banu Israel following them and any other believers, they go and they reach the edge of the sea. They reach the shore. And at that place in time, the Quran in another place says, فَأَتْبَعُوهُمْ مُشْرِقِينَ That they basically followed them in the morning. That when they, Fir'aun and the Qibtiyun woke up in the morning and they said, Where did everybody go? Where'd everybody go? So they said, ah, they're trying to run away. Let's go, everybody, come on. And they got everyone together and they rolled out. And now they were rolling deep and they were rolling heavy. They, he brought the whole army. فَأَتْبَعَهُمْ فِرْعَوْنُ بِجُنُدِهِ Fir'aun followed them with his entire army. And while waiting there at the edge of the sea, at the edge of the ocean for instruction and guidance from Allah, Fir'aun's army started to come into come into to sight. They started to be able to see Fir'aun's army marching up, armed to the teeth, thirsty for blood. And Banu Israel started to freak out. They completely lost it. And they said, Ya Musa, inna la mudrakun. It shows you the weakness on our part in faith. La takhafu darakan, you will not be caught. And what are they saying? Inna la mudrakun. We've been caught. Exactly what they were told not to be afraid of. Musa, we've been caught. What did you do, Musa? What did you do? Inna la mudrakun. We've been caught. Musa alayhi salam with the firmness and the conviction of iman and faith that he had, he said, Kalla. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You need to stop that right there. I'm not hearing any of that. Why? Because my Lord is with me. Say, me. He will make a way for me. He will guide me. He'll tell me exactly what to do. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam, فَضْرِبْ بِعَصَاكَ الْبَحْرَ And Musa alayhi salam goes. Now imagine again the scene. Try to imagine what that moment must have been like. Banu Israel completely freaking out. A huge army with Fir'aun standing there, thirsty for blood. A huge ocean in front of you, a sea in front of you. Nowhere to go, trapped. Musa a.s. steps forward and lifts his staff and then strikes the ocean with his staff. And the next thing that happens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally removes the water from the path. Now based on that other ayah in surah number 26, surah to shuara فَكَانَ كُلُّ فِرْقٍ فَكَانَ كُلُّ فِرْقٍ This basically establishes and corroborates what we find in many riwayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just make one huge path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally made 12 walkways for the 12 different tribes of Banu Israel. Each and every single one of them completely dried up. And they just walked straight through. Said, come on, let's go. And they started to walk through. And they're literally walking through the ocean. Water standing on either side of them. And they're just strolling right on through. Going forward. Now the believers are there. Musa alayhi salam is there. Now imagine Fir'aun and his army. The first reaction Fir'aun must, must have had was, all right, this is too much. Like I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. This Musa has been a lot of trouble. And I've seen a lot. This is just too much. But Fir'aun being a master politician and being conniving and scheming, he saw the looks on the faces of his army and saw that they were completely bewildered at this point, ready to run for the hills, that, Musa, that Fir'aun, he turns to his people and he says, look what I've done. <laughs> Check it out. High five somebody right here. <laughs> right? 
That's what Fir'aun says. Like, look, look at this. Didn't I tell y'all I was in charge? Didn't I tell y'all? I told you all along. Y'all didn't want to listen. Now what's up? Now let's go. There's something that needs to be understood here about human nature. Fir'aun obviously deep down inside, at some level, realized this wasn't because of him. I mean, remember we talked about when these adab from Allah, these tests and trials from Allah would come, he'd go and he would, he would plead with Musa a.s. Come on, please. Come on. Please. Just ask your Lord to remove it. I'm, I, I, I'm, I swear. I'll, I'll give up Banu Israel. And he kept turning back. So deep down inside, he knew. That this is again Musa alayhi salam. That this is the Lord of Musa alayhi salam taking care of Musa alayhi salam and the believers. He knew that deep down inside. But that arrogance, and that arrogance, we talked about it earlier, it's like that ego, that arrogance, that power, it's a trip. It's an intoxication. That it can be so powerful, so overwhelming, that a person can literally lose their common sense. And that's what happened with Fir'aun here. He marches and walks right in. Let's go everybody. Look what I've made arrangements for. Not realizing that he was walking into a trap. He was walking, in, walking straight into his grave. He was walking straight into death. But that arrogance, that ego is that overwhelming. It is that intoxicating. Very important for us to understand that and learn that. And this was the same thing at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. That they would walk right into their deaths. They would walk right to their doom. They would set themselves up for failure. The opposition to the Prophet ﷺ. So, فَأَتْبَعَهُمْ فِرْعَوْنُ بِجُنُودِهِ So he followed them there. And then he saw this all split open. So he walked right in. And Allah talks about this in Surah Al-Shu'ara. He walked right in after them. In Surah Yunus it is alluded to as well. Surah number 10, it's referred to as well. They walked right in. And what happened? Allah says, فَغَشِيَهُمْ مِنَ الْيَمِّ مَا غَشِيَهُمْ فَغَشِيَهُمْ مِنَ الْيَمْ And the water basically covered them. It drowned them. مَا غَشِيَهُمْ And I explained this last time we came across it. فَأَوْحَى إِلَى when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا يُوحَى مَا يُوحَى إِذْ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّكَ مَا يُوحَى مَا غَشِيَهُمْ It's an expression, which basically means you can't, it can't even be put into words and explained how Allah drowned them. How they were drowned in that water, in that sea, in the ocean on that day. وَأَضَلَّ فِرْعَوْنُ قَوْمَهُ In ayah number 79, Allah says, وَأَضَلَّ فِرْعَوْنُ قَوْمَهُ that Fir'aun led his people astray. Fir'aun led his people astray. There's a very, very important point for us to note here about the responsibility of leadership. The responsibility of leadership. When you are in a position of leadership, and make no mistake about this, whenever we hear a talk or the accountability or the responsibilities of leadership, we right away want to talk about, you know, politicians. We right away want to look at, you know, the board member of the masjid. But you have to understand one thing. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu says, Kullukum ra'in. Each and every single one of you is a shepherd. Each and every single one of you is responsible. Wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyatihi. And each and every single one of you will be asked about his flock, about his responsibility. That the word for responsibility in the Arabic language is mas'uliya, which literally translates to something you will be asked about. Something you'll be asked about. We love to focus on the power, the authority that comes with responsibility, with leadership. But what we need to be cognizant of is the weight, the burden, and the responsibility that comes with leadership. That's much, much more important for us to be cognizant and aware of. And so Fir'aun doomed himself. He drowned himself. And those people who followed Fir'aun, they had a hand. It takes two to tango. The wife of Fir'aun didn't play along, did she? She didn't comply with Fir'aun and his conditions, did she? And look what happened to her. 
But she stood her ground. The magicians didn't play along with Fir'aun's game, did they? And look what happened with them. So these people who followed Fir'aun, obviously they followed Fir'aun. So they have a share, they have a stake in this. But at the same time, while they will be held accountable for what they did, Fir'aun as their leader, as the man leading them and being responsible for them, not only will have to answer for what he did, but will have to answer for what all of them did as well. What they all did as well, Fir'aun will also have to answer for that. And every single leader always has to be cognizant and aware of this. This is a very interesting, I, 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 think, I believe I talked about it a little bit earlier in the durus, but leadership within Islam and the, the, the Sharia of Muhammad وسلم, the teachings of the Prophet وسلم, leadership is a very interesting issue. Leadership is a need and a necessity. Someone's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. And if you are the man fit for the job, if you are the person fit for that responsibility, and you are being thrust into that position, you are being promoted to that position to take that responsibility and serve the ummah through this position, it does behoove you to accept that responsibility. However, at the same time, what cannot be discounted is the ihtiraz, is the ijtinab, is the taqwa of some of the sahaba radiallahu anhum. That is admirable as well. There were some sahaba who never accepted a position of responsibility, no matter how much they were pushed to do so. There can be a discussion about what is more afdal, what is more awla, what is more praiseworthy or desirable in a, in a particular situation. We can talk about that, but at the same time, we cannot discount that fact that responsibility is a burden, it is a weight on the shoulders, and we need to be aware and cognizant of that. There are times, there are situations, I personally have dealt with times and situations where there is someone that obviously has some qualities, has some talents, has some abilities, has the skill set, has the qualities that the ummah needs. And that the ummah needs them to lead and to serve in a certain capacity. And I have literally tried to drag these people by their, by their feet, begging, pleading with, begging and pleading with them to assume this responsibility, but they will resist, they will resist. And it can get a little frustrating at times. That you got to understand, the ummah needs this. But I'll tell you one thing. I'll take a hundred of those people any day of the week over the person who himself or herself is overzealous about assuming responsibility or leadership without any consideration for what is the actual accountability and the burden and what is at stake there. We have far too many people willing to take responsibility and leadership with no care and consideration as to what it entails, then the people who are a little too apprehensive about assuming leadership, that's not a problem we have as an ummah. That's a problem maybe a couple of people have. But as an ummah, we currently struggle. Now again, that's not to frighten someone away. One of my teachers taught me something very interesting about this. At the Khati workshop, I was asked the same question. And so this is something I learned from one of my teachers. That we don't discourage people from stepping up and serving the ummah, but what, continue needs to be, what continuously needs to be pounded away, needs to be hammered nonstop, is the understanding of the level of responsibility and accountability that comes with leadership. We never sleep on that. That message cannot be stated enough times. We can never overstate the importance, the necessity, and the weight and the burden that responsibility and leadership comes with. We cannot overstate that. And that's something that needs to be there in the tarbiyah of people who are serving the ummah. The people that are actually serving the ummah, there are different tones. The Prophet ﷺ said, you, you deal with people according to their level and their capacity and who and where they are. And so yes, there's a motivational, inspirational message to do more, do more, do more for each and every single believer. But people who are actually in a capacity of serving, the purpose is not to demotivate them. The purpose is not to demoralize them. The purpose is not to beat them down. And there needs to be an arm put around the shoulder a lot more than the tough conversation, than the tough love that is this thou. But at the same time, that tough love needs to be given out. 
the worst thing that can ever happen to anyone who serves the ummah, who leads the ummah, who works for the ummah, the worst thing that can ever happen to them is when they drink their own Kool-Aid. Is when they buy their own stock. That's the worst thing that can happen. That is a tragedy for that person, their akhirah, and that is a tragedy for the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu would beg and plead for people's forgiveness as Khalifa. Umar radiallahu anhu would regularly go and talk to Hudhayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu and just be like, am I amongst the list of the hypocrites and munafiqoon, the list that the Prophet gave you? And you say, no, 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 Umar, you're not. And this was a question we would ask him regularly, frequently. This was the weight, this was the burden that they felt of leadership. They served the ummah, but understanding exactly what the responsibility of that was. Fir'aun led his people astray. He has a share in this, of the suffering, of the accountability and the punishment. This is why Allah says that Fir'aun and his close people, Fir'aun and his posse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Annaru yu'raduna alayha ghuduwan wa ashigan. That today, even now, that they are being punished morning and evening, morning and evening, morning and evening. And the day that the reckoning, the day that the, the hour will occur, the reckoning will begin, the day of judgment will arrive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command the, the angels and the malaika, Adkhilu, enter them. Adkhilu ala Fir'aun, enter Fir'aun and his little elite circle of leaders. Adkhilu ala Fir'aun ashadd al-adhab. Put them even, put them into the harshest punishment available. Because they have to be punished not just for what they did, but for what they made and they let everyone else to do as well. So, Adalla Fir'aun qawmahu wa ma hada, and he did not guide. Meaning he didn't set the proper example. And this is another very subtle note here, embedded into the ayah. That guiding, a leader has also a role in terms of the guiding of the people. And again, each and every single one of us is a leader. I didn't complete. Each and every single one of us is a leader. We are all leaders in our own capacity. Whether it be in our communities, whether it be amongst our friends, whether it be in our own homes, even if it be over our other younger siblings, whatever the capacity is, we always serve in a position of leadership. And we need to conduct ourselves by the higher morals and the ethics of leadership. We need to be cognizant of what that requires of us. And that a leader guides those people who are following him, first and foremost, through his own example. He has to set the example. It's not about what we say, it's not about what we command, but it's about how we live and how we conduct ourselves and how we manage ourselves. We have to light the way through our own example. And Fir'aun didn't do that. And that's going to come back on him. Real quickly, one thing I'd like to mention here from Surah Yunus is what transpired, what happened with Fir'aun. Real quickly, Musa a.s. because of the just brutal torture, the escalating violence. Musa alayhi salam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbana liyud, he says, Rabbana innaka atayt, innaka atayta fir'aun wa mala'uhu zinatan wa amwalan fil hayati dunya. Oh Allah, you've given them a lot of power, a lot of glitz and glamour and glory in this world. Rabbana liyudillu an sabilik. And what do they use everything for? Just to take people away from your path. Rabbana tumis ala amwalihim, washtuda ala kulubihim. Oh Allah, obliterate their wealth. Just wipe out their wealth. And number two, then tie up their hearts, meaning harden their hearts, close their hearts. Fala yu'minu, so that they do not believe. Hatta yrawul adab al alim, until they see a very painful, tormentful punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, your prayers have been answered. Musa and Harun, your prayers have been answered. فَاسْتَقِيمَا So you stay steadfast. وَلَا تَتَّبِعَانِ سَبِيلَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And don't follow the people, the path of these people who don't understand, who don't realize. So then Allah says, وَجَاوَزْنَا بِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْبَحْرَ we, we allowed Banu Israel to cross through the sea. فَأَتْبَعَهُمْ فِرْعَوْنُ وَجُنُودُهُ بَغْيًا وَعَدْوًا Fir'aun and his army followed out of rebelliousness and animosity and hatred for Allah, for His Messenger, and for these believers. 
Finally, when, the, when he started to drown, Fir'aun, قَالَ آمَنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي قَالَ آمَنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي He said, I believe in the one that there's no one worthy of worship but him. آمَنَتْ بِهِ بَنُوْ إِسْرَائِيلِ بَنُوْ إِسْرَائِيلِ has believed in him. One of the subtleties of this ayah is he still didn't, couldn't get himself like the magicians that said, آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ هَارُونَ وَمُوسَى آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ رَبِّ مُوسَى وَهَارُون he still didn't want to give any credit to Musa He says, Banu Israel has believed in them. وَأَنَا مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And I submit myself. But what happened at that time is that's that overlap. Those, that's that crossroads. Where you stand, where you're at at that moment. Where you are leaving and departing the world. But the life of the hereafter becomes apparent to you. In those last few final waning moments. This was something that many of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum they experienced. This is something that, you know, there are accounts of people even experiencing that. That when a person begins to depart this world, depart this life, Fir'aun is drowning. He sees the angels, he sees the malaika, he sees the souls of people departing and drowning and dying. The life of the hereafter is apparent to him, open to him. And as a last attempt, He's trying, to, he's trying to basically find a way out. He's trying to con himself, con his way out of this situation. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to him, Al-ana? Al-ana? Now? Seriously, now? Now you want to say this? Now you want to do this? After you see everything? وَقَدْ عَصَيْتَ قَبْلْ And every single moment leading up to the last second before this, as the army marched into the ocean, you were completely defiant and disobedient of Allah. And you were, ravaging, you were ravaging the earth. You were going around, rampaging, making trouble, causing chaos everywhere you went. Destroying people's lives. Till the very last second before this moment. And now that you see, as Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu used to say, Anasu niyam. Anasu niyamun. People are sleeping. People are asleep. People are fast asleep. Knocked out. Ida matu intabahu. When people die, they actually wake up. That moment that the soul starts to leave the body, you realize what's happening. You realize what's at stake. And so Allah said, no, 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 no. And the Qur'an actually alludes to something that is found in previous scriptures that after Banu Israel crossed through and they turned around and they looked back and they saw the ocean collapse and they saw Fir'aun and his entire army drowning, Banu Israel had suffered through generations of oppression, violence, hardship at the hands of Fir'aun and his people. They were so terrified of Fir'aun, they refused to believe that he was dead. And they asked Musa alayhi salam that we have to see it to believe that he's dead. We have to see it to believe that he's dead. Like they were terrified. Like no, he's going to pop out of anywhere, just any moment. He's going to show up again and ruin our lives. Like it's too good to be true. And this is corroborated here in the Quran where in Surah Yunus, ayah number 92, Allah says, فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَا that today we will save your body so that it will serve, so that you will be a sign for the people that you leave behind. That you will be a sign for the people that stay behind you. That they were able to receive this ibrah. And it's said in the narrations that the body of Fir'aun was literally spit out. It was thrown out by the ocean and it landed on the ground. And Banu Israel were able to look at the dead body of Fir'aun. And finally realized that the nightmare was over. That's how Fir'aun فَغَشِيَهُمْ مِنَ الْيَمِّ مَا غَشِيَهُمْ وَأَضَلَّ فِرْعَوْنُ قَوْمَهُ وَمَا هَدَى Now in ayah number 80, we're going to go ahead and stop here. Alright, inshallah, it's five minutes till salah. Ayah number 80 has a lot of context to it. I know I won't be able to complete it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to finish Surah Taha. Alright, say I mean, don't laugh.
Trust me, say ameen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.